I think we're ready to go. Huh? You just let me know when you're done eating your cookies, Senator Capito, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> was it? Kind of was, you know, every bite you got to think about. Um, welcome to the Rural Broadband Caucus uh, uh, meeting on agriculture, something that is an absolute uh, amazing development in my state. Um, let me kind of lay the stage for you. Um, my state is a state where about 25% of my um, economy is agriculture. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a sad fact, is that the average age of American farmers is between 58 and 60 years old. Think about that. So when I go to farm meetings, when I go to farm bureau meetings, farmers union meetings, the corn growers, I'm usually sitting with people my age or older um, who, are, <laughs> who are basically engaged in agriculture. That's not true when I go to one event. Farmers union over the last probably 10 years has engaged in technology and agriculture. And when I walk into that room, there are 20-year-old farmers and 30-year-old farmers and 40-year-old farmers who are looking for a different way, a different way to earn a living on the farm, a different way to apply the things that they enjoy, and that's technology, into the occupation and the career that they've chosen, which is to be farmers and ranchers in my state. And so, um, uh, I, can, I can only begin to tell you of the incredible techniques that are used every day in farming, whether it is knowing your soil type and being able to distinguish between one pass that you would take in applying agriculture or uh, pesticides to coming back and, and doing it still again. And so hopefully this technology is going to reduce input costs for my farmers. Um, it's going to make it possible for them to be much more um, I think uh, effective in what they do. But it also means that this is a challenging occupation that is going to be dependent on how wired we are. I mean, I can envision a time in American agriculture where someone sits in an office in their machine shed and basically um, plants uh, a quarter section of land in a day, operating their tractor from, not the tractor, but um, uh, from automation. None of that is possible if we don't have the backbone of connectivity. None of what I'm talking about is possible if we're not able to connect. And so I think when you look across the, um, uh, certainly for production agriculture, this is a, the wave of the future and it also is an essential, it's an essential service or utility that we need to encourage young people to go into farming. Because if they think they're going to farm just the way their grandpa farmed, it's not likely we're going to get them out there. And so um, I, I think it is absolutely critical. The second reason why engaging in rural broadband and doing this work is so important to rural America is because I have what I call the Netflix test. You know, when I was in state office back in the 90s, we used to sit around and go, how do you get people to stay on the farm, stay in rural areas? And we would have a long discussion about, well, you, you create jobs. And so we would encourage primary sector manufacturing, value-added agriculture. We would encourage all these new jobs. When I was up in the northeast region of my state, I was talking to the economic development people. You know what they told me? We have 80 primary sector jobs, all pretty high paying, and we can't get anyone to work them. Because people don't see the kind of lifestyle that they believe they want in um, rural America. So I tell them, well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to pass the Netflix test. Because I don't think a lot of people are going to live in a place where they can't stream uh, movies, where they can't get connectivity, where they can't FaceTime their grandkids or their, or their um, uh, children. They, that this is an essential utility. It is just as essential as electric power was back in the 30s and 40s. We have to fight for it the way we fought for uh, electric power back then. And um, in this task and in this mission and in this goal has been the champion, the chair, the person who has done the most to bring the Rural Broadband Caucus alive, and that's Shelley Moore Capito. Um, I just want to uh, uh, tell a story about uh, Shelley. It's good, it's good. She's a really good ball player and a be probably a better tennis player, but I'll play tennis, so I don't know about that. But but, um, you know, I, I frequently say this. I say, never 
get in between a good idea and a postmenopausal woman. We'll <laughs> run you over, and this is a good idea. But I remember um, we all, when you go to the White House, and we had a, you probably remember this, Shelley. We had a dinner with the president when the president was first elected. He invited probably probably eight of us to come and have um, lunch with him, talk about what was on our mind, and we all had our pet project. Shelly jumps in immediately, says, "Rural broadband, rural broadband, rural broadband. If you're going to do, um, if you're going to do inter, uh, uh, infrastructure, it has to include rural broadband." And she she could have fought for a whole lot of things in the five minutes of attention that she was going to get to the president, but this is what she fought for. And um, I'm grateful for her leadership. I'm grateful for her help, and I want to um, welcome her to the podium, Shelly Moore Capital. Thank you, Heidi. Is Senator Heidkamp. I am going to ask Senator Smith if she has a time commitment because I think you were in front of me. Would you like to go first? Okay. No, I just I just want to be fair. In busy days, Senator Bozeman, you're all right. He's always all right. He's a great guy. Well, anyway, I, I want to thank our our panelists uh, for coming and being here today. And I really think Senator Heidkamp can frame the issue of broadband uses in agriculture much better. Than, than somebody from, from West Virginia, where we have smaller tracts, smaller portions of just as important uh, business agriculture. And I think, she, we, she, I think she framed that portion of what we're gonna talk about today, I guess in a broader sense, the reason I'm so passionate, the first opportunity I got to talk to the president was rural broadband into the infrastructure package. Uh, we convinced him of that. The problem is we didn't get the infrastructure package, but we did get $600 million in the uh, USDA, which is going to be critical, and, and this part of uh, the broadband deployment in agriculture is going to be important. But we've our, this is our third meeting. We have focused on a telehealth expo where all of our states got to feature some of the ways that our states are individually using telehealth to... Uh, to reach our constituents in our state of West Virginia with the opioid crisis that prevents a, presents a great uh, opportunity for telehealth, mental health, and, uh, and those kinds of things. We also uh, did one on education. Uh, I always ask for a show of hands of students when I'm ever talking with them in the classroom, how many have connectivity when they go home. It's shameful when half of them raise their hand and the other half don't. So who's behind? You can figure that out by the show of hands when they come into class the next day. So what we're trying to do by these having these um, meetings is to is to broaden our base of support and the and the uh, I didn't even think about AV uh, autonomous vehicle tractors with uh, with the broadband connectivity. I always still think of the. Uh, of the person driving at the same time. Yeah, you can uh, get all into that, John. Um, but uh, that, I think that's a very, very exciting uh, prospect here. So uh, I think that the FCC has been a great partner here, particularly in the uh, deployment of rural broadband and focusing on correct mapping and other things that have, have been problematic in the past. Uh, I think that um, Ann has been to West Virginia to cut the ribbon on a really nice project for us, which was a wireless project of 4,000 uh, people in very rural parts of uh, our, our uh, state to be able to realize uh, the availability of broadband, and the private sector is, is absolutely crucial. So I'm excited about today to learn about agriculture, and every day I'm adding something else. My newest one's tourism, because it's the Netflix thing. People want to disconnect. They want to go down the New River. Gorge, that, who's been down the New River Gorge here? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But when you want to get back in your room, you might want to either A, work, or B, watch Netflix or something of that nature. So uh, it, tourism is another aspect, I think, of our economy that really uh, is going to rely more and more on connectivity. So thank you all for being here. This is a great crowd. I also want to thank Victoria Flood in my office because she's really the one who organizes all this and has been the, there you go, there's a nice close-up for you. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, one of our partners is uh, Senator uh, Tina Smith is here to give her perspectives. And thank you again. Here is a, I, I believe I am the proud newest member of the Senate Broadband Caucus, and I really am excited to, to be here with my colleagues. Um, you know, in Minnesota, uh, in Minnesota when I was Lieutenant Governor, I spent a lot of time talking about rural broadband. 
I traveled all over the place, and you know, like uh, like Heidi State, agriculture is really the backbone of Minnesota's economy. It is what makes um, it, it fuels thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, and it also fuels small town and rural Minnesota, and it also fuels big town and big city Minnesota because the um, ag economy and the food economy are so linked. And after I traveled around the state and talked to lots of people about broadband, I. You know, just I kept hearing over and over again, you know, broadband isn't something that's nice to have. It is something that is necessary for the ag economy to work. And it, whether you're thinking about the the big, um, you know, precision uh, precision farming combines that are you know that are out there, or whether you're thinking about the the spouse of the farmer who as needs to work a second job. And in order to do that job, I talked to a woman in southern Minnesota. She had a fantastic job uh, doing this sort of um, gene recombinant gene research. But she couldn't do that work at home because it was taking hours and hours and hours to download and upload the research that she was working on. And so her quality of life and actually their ability to stay on the farm related directly to having good broadband. And then I've talked to kids who Literally in northern Minnesota, you know, they, they get on the bus, the bus has a hot spot, but they can't get off the bus at the end of the road in the wintertime until they finish their homework because they don't have broadband when they get, um, when they walk in the door of their, own, of their own home. So all of these are great examples of why broadband is not nice to have, it is necessary to have, it is the infrastructure of the 21st century economy, and if you want to participate, you have to be you have to be connected. Um, already, so I've only been here a little over five months. We, we're making some headway. I'm, I was so pleased to see the money that we had and the um, big bills we passed earlier this year. And I'm also really pleased that the Farm Bill has um, um, some additional um, um, support and resources through the Community Connect program, which I have worked on. These, in addition to the work that um, we are doing um, at the FCC, will, I think, really help to make a, a, a help to make a, um, a real dent in this challenge. But still in Minnesota, we have about 240, 250,000 households that are not yet connected at a speed that allows them to get to take care of their health care, take care of their homework, um, or take care of their jobs. And that is really our collective challenge. So I'm eager to hear about the ideas that we have here um, today. And I just want to thank Victoria and everyone for pulling this together. And it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Postman. I really appreciate it. And thank you uh, to uh, Shelley and to Heidi and to uh, Senator Smith um, and all of our people involved in this really important effort. Um, I think sometimes when people think about rural broadband, um, they don't always actually think about that precision agriculture piece of that. I think they think about it getting to the household and maybe to the farm, but they don't think about what that means in terms of modern agriculture. And I have seen that time and time again, whether it is a Jenny O in Minnesota that decided um, because they didn't have enough broadband that they actually would install themselves uh, broadband infrastructure to get uh, to the barn so they could test the temperatures after we were hit by avian flu in Minnesota and lost 8 million turkeys. One fact, if you learn nothing from today, it is that Minnesota is number one in the country for turkeys. That's true fact. <laughs> um, and so uh, those kinds of things are things you might not think about, but yet most farmers and most ag interests are not going to be able to install that broadband itself. So it is not a solution, but it is just an example. Or the farmers that in order to run their precision ag equipment are going to McDonald's parking lots in Wilmer, Minnesota. Or um, my favorite positive example, a company called Acre, uh, that is down in Winnebago, Minnesota, that I visited, that is actually using precision, precision agriculture type techniques and research to be able to measure how much water do you really need um, through drones and other things, and what kind of information do you really 
uh, have to have that's going to help even small farmers to save money and at the same time have positive conservation effects with pesticides and other things. If you know exactly what you need by being able to map out the land and not do it with human beings but do it with visually um, and use that information, you're going to be able to save a lot of money and also have better conservation practices. So those are just a few examples why it is so important uh, to get broadband. I know you heard from my colleague uh, Tina, and I um, think you know how much imp how important this is to our uh, state. Uh, Senator Wicker and I have introduced the Precision Agriculture Connectivity Act to identify gaps in coverage and encourage broadband deployment on farms and ranch land. It would create a task force at the FCC to identify and measure current gaps in broadband coverage on cropland and ranch land and would also have the FCC uh, develop recs for achieving service on 95 percent of croplands and ranch lands in the U.S. by 2025. Um, we're excited about the Farm Bill um, and Senator Heitkamp and I um, and um, Senator Bozeman and Senator Smith uh, serve on the um, Ag Committee, and that's a good beginning. But if we're really going to roll out broadband like we want to, it's going to be more than just out of the USDA. Uh, we have to look at what's happening with the Commerce Department, what's happening with how we do the Universal Service Fund, um, and how through an infrastructure package we make sure that there's enough money devoted to broadband for our rural areas. I've always believed that kids grow up who grow up in rural America should be able to live in rural America. And in today's world, that can no longer happen unless they connect up with broadband and not just slow speed broadband. I said that really slow. <laughs> but also um, high-speed broadband, which is the key to all this. So thank you so much, and thank you to my colleagues. I have two, three hearings at once, and so I really appreciate it. Thank you. There's nothing wrong with talking slow. <laughs> Very much. Well, thank you all for being here. It's so important. The, uh, you know, as I was thinking about uh, all the different things that we've been talking about, uh, you mentioned, uh, Heidi mentioned that uh, it was 25% of the income in their state. It's 25% of the income in Arkansas. And everybody talking about their state, you know, we think of Silicon Valley, we think of all of the great things that are going on in California. But, but again, agriculture is, is the driver there. So for most of our states, the vast, vast majority of it is a huge driver of the economy. But when you get out in our smaller communities, and I don't care where you're at, if you're in North Dakota or Minnesota or West Virginia or wherever, it's not 25% of the economy, it's probably 90% of the economy. So it is so, so very important for rural America. Um, the other thing is I want to emphasize really quickly, as you can see, this is a very bipartisan effort. Uh, this is something that we're, we're united in trying to get done. Uh, and, and again, have come together and uh, are working very, very hard uh, in this way. Uh, Arkansas is number one in rice. They grow, grow a bunch of everything, soybeans, corn, cotton, you name it. But we're 48th in broadband. And so that's something that has to be fixed, and we're working very, very hard. The other thing that, that really sums this up to me is you can go through the rural parts of the country, rural Arkansas, West Virginia, North Dakota, wherever, and you go to a school, you'll see kids with the, with the tailgate down literally doing their homework, uh, you know, feeding off the, inter the Internet that's in the schoolhouse uh, on the weekends and in the evening. So... Lots of problems, but uh, what it's all about is us working together to try and solve them. And I think we're, we're moving in that dire direction. I want to introduce Elizabeth Bowles, CEO of Aristotle in Little Rock. And then I always forget your official chair of the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee for the FCC. We're very, very proud of her. Uh, she does a tremendous job in Arkansas. and. Uh, She's a busy lady with lots to do. The fact that she serves on the board and has agreed to, to chair it, they've done a great job. But uh, it's, you know, it's a lot of time, a lot of commitment, so we really do appreciate you all. I want to thank all of the panel for being here and all that you represent and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
I'm a lot shorter than the center. So first of all, I would like to thank the Senate Broadband Caucus for inviting me to moderate this panel. It's a great honor, and I hope I do them proud. As the Senator mentioned, I am the chair of the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee. That committee was formed to address state and municipal barriers to alleviate the digital divide, separating those who do and do not have broadband in this country. And we talk a lot about the unserved, but there are also a vast number of people not in that 31% figure that's been thrown around that are underserved. They have access to broadband, but it's not fast enough to do homework. It's not fast enough to, to stream Netflix, et cetera. And so I'm hoping that this panel will be able to address some of these issues. And I have a list of questions here. And I think if there's time at the end, I will open it up for anybody else. And I reserve the right as the moderator to sort of jump in too, if that's helpful. But first, I would like to introduce the panel. So, Anne Hazlett, who is the, U the Assistant to the Secretary for Rural Development at the USDA. We have John Rauber, did I pronounce your name right? Who is the Director of Washington Affairs for Deer and Company. And Brendan Carr, Commissioner of the Federal Communication Commission. And I believe that we're going to take a few minutes for every panelist to say a few words. I'll start, and then I believe that you have a video, yes? So if you don't mind. Sure. Oh. Okay, do you want to show your video first? We'll do the video first. So John will make your statement first. Okay. This is the very uh, nervous portion of the program when you have to run a video that we really didn't get a chance to test out, but we'll try it. Um, uh, my name is John Rober and I'm with John Deere uh, here in Washington. Um, I'm also here representing a group called the, um, uh, uh, called the um, uh, Agriculture Broadband Coalition. And uh, we're a group of uh, equipment manufacturers, um, uh, producer groups, American Farm Bureau, National Corn Growers Association, American Soybean Association, Agriculture uh, Retailers Association, uh, technology companies, and we're all involved in um, trying to figure out how we can best uh, serve the technology demand or needs of, of agriculture and precision agriculture in particular. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to show a video here in a minute as, a, as I talk here. Um, there's a lot that's been going on, as I think most people here know, uh, in the field. And uh, John Deere is simply one company involved in this. We're very proud of our uh, heritage in this space. We like to think of, uh, of, uh, of this time uh, in agriculture as about as revolutionary as when uh, tractors were and mechanization was introduced to the field 100 years ago. 1918 was the year that John Deere bought a uh, tractor company in Waterloo, Iowa. And at that time, it was considered a pretty revolutionary step. There was a divided opinion at the company's board of directors about whether mechanization would ever catch on. Um, and um, I think we know the history of that. So I'm going to quick check to this uh, video. It's the show and tell portion. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we've seen here. My name is Dan Kilmer and I'm a farmer in North Central Illinois. We are uh, in spring 2017 and it's planting season. The calendar says it's time to go, so we're moving. I'm Daryl Kilmer. I've farmed all of my life. This is when you really like to plant corn in this area. So today we'll be working around with the field cultivator and planting corn with the corn planters. I'm Justin Blanchett, Precision Ag Business Manager with AHW. Started off a little wet to begin our season, so kind of built the anxiety. But the uh, last five days, we've been rolling strong, pushing hard, and uh, have a good outlook here the next three days. When the weather gets right and the ground's working the way you want it, then it's go time.
My name is Ben Smith, and I'm an advanced marketing project manager for John Deere. I actually started with the Kilmers last year, taking a, a grower that really wasn't using any technology and started to learn and understand what different levels of technology adoption look like. So last year it started mainly with just auto track and section control, especially for planting. And the Kilmers have picked it up really fast. I've only got about a half a day left, and we're going to have all the corn in the ground here. And it's been very beneficial for them. My name is Tim Kilmer, and I'm a farmer in north central Illinois. Uh, this technology really dramatically helps make planning easier and more efficient. It takes the stress off of me having to steer. It takes the stress off of me having to get rows turned on and off at the correct times. It automates a lot of things that make my job easier. Here we go, along the trees with no hands. And ultimately, it's not just technology for technology's sake. It's actually technology that helps a grower by allowing them to do a better job. My dad farmed his entire farming career, and he always took pride in straight rows. But with the auto track, a beginner can take off with a planter and have bullet straight rows, just like a pro that has been farming all of his life. The efficiency with the suction control is fantastic. When I overlap on headlands, it doesn't waste any seed. And when we get into fields with odd-shaped headlands along creeks or, or curved boundaries, it will automatically shut the rows off. It really is very, very efficient. So the introduction of data has given Kilmers another resource that's valuable in the determination of their hybrid placements. Because we have those maps, we're able to see how specific hybrids performed on specific soil types. There is a definite sense of relief knowing that on a long day that I have to plan into the night. Well, I got the south edge down there and the east edge. I know I have that technology to really help me do a good job. The technology, it, it does cost but there is payback from it. The most rewarding part of planting season is going through a big hard push and getting a lot of work done and then coming back when everything's coming out of the ground perfect and everything looks good. It's a good feeling when things are going right when you're out there planting. We're nearly wrapped up with the corn planting for 2017 and we'll be anxious to get started in the beans. Right after that the product application season starts and before we know it it'll be harvest time again. Just a couple of quick words there. You're looking at a farmer who, uh, or a farming family, six generations in central Illinois. Um, they hadn't really adopted a lot of technology. A couple things you saw there are really the kind of the first level, which is uh, GPS guided technology enables you to do an awful lot of things. Uh, section control allows you to uh, do a lot of things in terms of uh, application of fertilizer and seed. The bottom line for most producers, and if you're from states where you represent producers, is I, uh, producers are looking to cut their costs, uh, increase their yields, and reduce their downtime, uh, which also goes to cost. And in doing so, uh, with technology, enables them to do each of those things, use less fuel, use less fertilizer, less pesticide, less seed, uh, increase their yields, uh, and be able to operate in the tight time windows that they have to, have to operate in, and that improves their technology, or excuse me, their profitability as well. Broadband is critical to this. I think that's maybe the, the, the second point I would leave with. And what we talk about broadband for precision agriculture, we're talking not so much about connecting people, connecting machines, because there are now more modems out on some of these parts of uh, rural America than there are people. And all the benefits of precision agriculture technology can only be realized if people and the, and the operations themselves are actually connected. So why don't I stop there, and then we can get into questions. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to, to join this event. It's really an honor to be here and 
talk about the importance of rural broadband uh, in rural America. When I think about the states that are represented here today and the senators that we've had an opportunity to learn from, I realized as I was preparing for this event that I've been to each of the states uh, that were reflected in the, in the opening comments, and I think about the projects that I have had an opportunity to see in this space while I've been there. In Minnesota, uh, the Renville Assembly uh, County Cooperative, uh, the Buchanan project that Senator Capito mentioned with respect to Community Connect. In Arkansas, there's a foundation, the Winrock Foundation, that's been very engaged in bringing connectivity to the, the Arkansas Delta as well as Louisiana. And in North Dakota, the Dakota Carrier Network had an opportunity to be there in February and see the tremendous build out that they've had in that state. So I think this issue is in such good hands, not just with the senators that are leading this effort, but with the leaders and the entities that they represent back in their states. You know, under the leadership of Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue, uh, we have a very keen focus on rural prosperity. And when we look at all that goes into building prosperity in these places, uh, rural connectivity, rural broadband is such a foundational issue. As has been mentioned by several speakers, we see this connectivity as being as important in agriculture and economic development as rails, uh, railroads, bridges and roads and airports. Uh, it's as vital today as rural electrification was uh, decades ago. We think about the 24 million Americans that do not have ac uh, strong access to high-speed internet. 80% of those people are in rural areas and on tribal lands according to recent data by the FCC and we compare that to just 2% uh, of people that are living in urban areas that don't have broadband access. So without that connectivity, so much more is at stake than inconvenience. Uh, we see this gap truly as a matter of rural prosperity. For farmers, as we see in the video, this gap really presents access to cutting technology to increase productivity. Uh, we think about the times that we're in in agriculture right now where uh, things are operating on such difficult margins and being able to save money on inputs uh, at such a critical time. In addition to the, the row crop side of agriculture, uh, we know in the livestock sector uh, this technology is equally important, um, say, to managing our feeding schedules, uh, to managing milking equipment in the dairy sector. But I think it's important uh, to recognize that this gap goes far beyond production agriculture. It has such a dramatic impact on the places in which many farm families live and work. Uh, for rural businesses, uh, the small businesses that are on the main streets in these communities, these gaps prevent access to new markets uh, through e-commerce. Uh, and for people that are living in a big city, when people in rural America are not connected, this prevents them, the people in living in a city, being able to access the many things that are made and grown in these communities. As Senator Bozeman uh, reflected, we think about children that are growing up in small towns and the stories about kids that are doing their homework out of McDonald's parking lot, uh, or not at all. This means that that next generation of children that are living in rural America do not have access to that same quality of education that their urban peers do. And for families and seniors that are in rural America, this gap certainly limits um, access to quality health care. And oftentimes this is happening in communities that have very challenging health outcomes uh, to begin with. So again, with the magnitude of this issue, we believe uh, that e-connectivity is a foundational issue, whether we're talking about business opportunity, uh, distance learning, uh, healthcare, workforce development. We also believe that if we address many of the challenges that we see with e-connectivity, so many of the other issues that we see in rural America, whether it's quality of life or economic opportunity, simply become uh, more manageable. So as we look at tackling this issue uh, in our piece of, of the larger puzzle at USDA, uh, we are really focused on a number of things. First, we are looking to drive greater collaboration between the federal, many federal agencies that play a role in tackling this challenge. We're also improving the management of our own programs at USDA, trying to primarily simplify the application process so that communities can more easily access the resources that we have available. And we're lastly also looking at how we can innovate in the deployment of this technology, both in t of this infrastructure, both in terms of the technology that can bring that access, but also in terms of the partners that who can help us reinvigorate some of these disconnected places across the country. 
Uh, we had a, an exciting boost to our tools in the toolbox, if you will, in the 2018 spending bill. Many of you may know that there was $600 million that Congress included in additional funding in the 2018 omnibus legislation. This is money for a new broadband pilot. Um, that will enable the construction of far uh, more rural broadband infrastructure than we have known before. It will also enable us to innovate in the way we deploy this infrastructure. So with that, I'll look forward to the questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for uh, the invitation, and it was great to hear the senator is talking about really the diverse use cases and what broadband means to agriculture today. And in my time at the FCC, I've had a chance to see both sides of the digital divide. Those rural communities that have next generation connectivity and what it means for them in terms of economic opportunity, telehealth, education. And we've seen the other side, communities that are still striving to get their fair shot at next gen connectivity. And Traveling the country, hearing their stories, really brings home the work that we need to do at the FCC with stakeholders here uh, in Congress, with our partner agencies as well, to really help close that divide. And last week, I met uh, Whitney. She's from Lambert, Montana. And her family runs a farming and ranching operation in the sort of extreme northeast corner of Big Sky Country. The area is actually famous for being the farthest place in the country from a Starbucks. It is 190 miles from that area to the closest Green Apron Barista. It's 100 miles round trip to get to the grocery store, and it's about a five and a half hour drive to the nearest big city. Yet Whitney is an Instagram star. She's out there in the field, she uses her smartphone, and she uses a 4G LTE connection that she has and she produces and records online videos. Her most famous one, she told me, is called CrossFit for Cows. It shows a 1,300-pound Hereford cow rolling with its head a bale of hay across a snow-covered field, and it went viral, and she now gets paid. She actually got a $500 check uh, not too long ago for that and these other videos that she's producing. And in some ways, she's lucky. There's a big highway that runs not too far from her uh, family-owned farm. So there's a cell tower there that provides 4G LTE. But as we've heard, there are millions of Americans still that don't have that opportunity. They either have no 4G or have only a subsidized 4G provider. So one thing we're doing at the commission is we have a $4.5 billion uh, fund, the mobility fund, that we are reorienting right now to help support, at a minimum, 4G service across the country. Not everybody is going to be the social media star that Whitney is, but at least they can get that next generation connectivity as well. And obviously, you know, becoming Instagram and YouTube famous is sort of a new aspect of the internet, but we're also seeing how you know, some of the oldest professions in rural America are also benefiting from broadband. I was in a uh, small town, Milford, Nebraska, a couple weeks ago. It was a feedlot. They hold uh, 1,500 cattle at this feedlot. And one of the oldest professions still is the American cowboy. This is where they're still used. They're pen riders. These are really uh, experts. They ride around these pens on horseback, and their job is to identify cattle that have either an illness or some issue, pick them out from the herd, and get them either an antibiotic or some other treatment. But it's difficult even for these expert pen riders. Landon was one of them that I was talking to. And it's hard because cattle uh, like to hide their symptoms. They don't want to get pulled uh, from the herd, and so they try to blend in. And so there was this company uh, out of Lincoln, Nebraska, called Quantified Ag. And they developed what they called Fitbit for cattle. And it's a little uh, device. Actually have, they gave me a sample of it. Uh, it's a device that goes on the ear of the cows and it tracks everything about them, their head movement, their body temperature, and that data is then crunched and sent up to the cloud, and it compares it with what you're expected to see. And with that broadband connection, they can identify those cows that are just minutely acting different than the herd. Then every morning around 8 o'clock, 8.30, there's a little red light that'll go off on the ear of the cow, 
if they're sort of out of uh, normal behavior. And the pen riders can then spot that red light, go in and use their expertise to decide, is this when we pull away, do we let it go? And without that broadband connection, they wouldn't have been able to deploy that technology, and they're seeing tremendous benefits already in improved herd health, reduction in the need uh, for antibiotics, more targeted treatments. So there's some new applications as well, and we were, we're hearing from John Deere about some of these uh, more truly precision ag examples. And a lot of times in D.C., when you think about precision ag and smart ag, you think about these big combines and how they can be GPS controlled and they can drive in a straight line, and that's great. We love our GPS controlled uh, tractors for sure. But I was in Moline, Michigan, and was really blown away with the amount of data that today's farmers are collecting. Uh, I met a relatively young person, Jason, 36 years old. He was born in West Michigan farm country, actually only a few miles from the crop supply company where he now works. And he's never been more optimistic about the future of farming uh, for people his age. And his job essentially now is to collect silos worth of data. He pulls drone-based images that are detailed enough to spot individual spots and changes in spots on a single leaf of a whole crop. They're LIDAR-based information they're pulling off of combines that identify the microclimates and the microfields within all of this, uh, just this tremendous amount of data. The problem is they collect this data, and then without a strong broadband connection, there's really nothing to do with it. They need a connection so the broadband can be sent back to the cloud, where it can then be crunched and prescriptions can be sent back to the field, and then you can make these real-time micro-adjustments in seeds. And we heard from one farmer that said, if you look at the desk of any farmer, you'll see old coffee mugs full of USB drives, because a lot of them are collecting this data but don't have a strong enough broadband connection to get that back to the cloud where it can be crunched. Uh, there was another farmer that we met, uh, Dwayne, and he sort of talked about the same problem. When we met him, he said that he used to go to church regularly, which I thought was an interesting opening line for uh, him to be telling an FCC commissioner. But the trick was this. The church parking lot had Wi-Fi. So he would take all of this data, go to the church, and upload it. And now he's got a new fixed wireless connection from a WISP. Uh, and he says he still goes to church, but now he can focus on a much higher purpose when he goes there. And so as we've traveled, we've seen both of these stores, the economic upside that we get, the hard work that goes into deploying broadband, and it really reinforces what we need to do at the FCC, and we're doing a couple things. One is we have this $10 billion a year universal service fund, and right now we're in the process of reorienting that fund to support truly unserved areas, and that's going to make a difference. We're also in the process of reducing regulatory red tape. One of the reasons why it's so hard to provide service in rural America is costs. It can be up to $30,000 to run just a mile of fiber in rural America. And these are places that have one or less than one uh, person per square mile. So imagine trying to put that cost and recover it over that. So there's work that we can do that can shrink the cost of deploying. And that's where some regulatory relief comes into play. We've taken a number of steps at the FCC to cut costs, and there's more to do. And we're freeing up spectrum as well, so some of these new innovations can be used uh, and get access to the spectrum they need. So there's a lot of work that we're doing, but there's still a lot more work for us to do. But I think we are particularly committed uh, at the FCC to closing this digital divide and getting more broadband to more Americans. So happy to take the questions on this. Thank you all very much. I, we have several questions for different people on the panel, which I will jump around a little bit and not take them in the order of those of you who have this sheet of questions. And I am mindful of the time. I would like to open it up for everybody else. I have questions of my own self. But to, but to start with, I would like to say that, that I agree with pretty much everything that was said here today. And when I look at the issues in rural America, it is not a one agency problem or one company problem a one advisory committee problem. This is a problem that we all need to address in a unified manner in order to get this accomplished. The mobility fund is awesome, but mobility, mobile phone service is not a substitute for a fixed service. You really need both. Rural America is entitled to both. And until we have comparable broadband service, both mobile and fixed in rural America, the battle is not done. So I would encourage everyone to take a long range view of this. The costs are real and they're significant. 
the WISP industry's costs are a lot lower than fiber costs, but they're still twice as expensive in rural America than they are anywhere else. And that is the main problem that we have to address as a nation. The farm lands are shrinking, not the lands themselves, but the people who run them, because the kids are leaving, because they want to live in the cities where they can get access to broadband. And we've all heard the stories of the kids in the McDonald's, and we know about them, and we hear about them so often. It's like, yes, well, I've heard that story. But it's important, because those kids who are studying outside the McDonald's are not going to stay to live there if they can't have the quality of life, and if their kids are going to have the same experience. We all want a better experience for their kids. My daughter lives in Little Rock. She has access to all of her curriculum online, all of it. And she has access to amazing curricula at an amazing school. I don't have to go 30 miles outside of Little Rock, and that will not be the case. Rural America is very close to the urban centers, and a lot of times the way we think about rural America, we have this vision in our minds of where it is. It's not very far from the urban core, but it might as well be in the middle of nowhere, literally and figuratively, because it is not getting the care that it needs. So with that sort of laudatory speech, I'm going to ask my first question of Ms. Hislett, which is, the administration and Congress are making effort to close the digital divide. So given all of the challenges, what steps are our federal partners taking to address these? We see, uh, I think has been noted and reflected by the fact that we have multiple agencies on the panel, really see uh, this as an all hands on deck approach and one that will take uh, great interagency coordination. So in order to do that, uh, we are working very closely with our federal partners uh, to better coordinate our policy and our programs. And we're doing that really for, through a number of ways. First, having regular conversation with Commerce and with FCC on deployment of the funding. Um, secondly, we, uh, USDA is the co-chair of the uh, Broadband Interagency Working Group along with Commerce. And here, many federal agencies with uh, resources to devote to broadband uh, gather to coordinate. Uh, two of the issues that we're currently working on together are regulatory barriers as well as mapping. And then lastly, there is a broadband uh, deployment advisory committee with the FCC that gives us an opportunity with our insight into rural America, uh, not only here in Washington, but the staff that we have in all 50 states that live and work in these places that can really offer recommendations to the agency um, and how to accelerate deployment of high-speed internet. And again, in addition to this interagency coordination with respect to USDA, we really look for continue, uh, continued improvement in how we deliver our own, uh, our own resources, simplified applications, um, improving the online application process, um, two examples. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna address the next question to Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Carr, what steps is the FCC taking to make broadband more readily available for applications such as smart agriculture. I know you talked about the mobility fund and other things like that, but what more can we expect in the future? Yeah, one, one issue that we are really focused on is cutting regulatory red tape. There. Okay, start again. So one issue that we're focused on is cutting regulatory red tape. A lot of people are starting to hear about this new technology, 5G, that's on the horizon. So right now, a lot of people have 3G or 4G service. Upwards of 80% of new deployments for 5G and even advanced 4G are going to be what we call small cells. So these are backpack or pizza box size antennas. Uh, so it's going to be different than those 100-foot, 200-foot towers that a lot of people think of when they think about uh, 4G service today. The problem we faced at the FCC was that our federal regulatory structures assume that every new antenna is a 200-foot tower. So we had long federal processes, costly federal processes that we were applying to small cells. And the problem is, where is that going to pinch us the most? It's really rural America where the business case is already difficult. If we have unnecessary regulatory costs, it's going to make it that much harder to deploy. And so what we did in March of this year was we excluded small cells from that federal process designed for much larger towers. And we're told from the record that should cut about 30% out of the total cost of deploying small cells. And if you think about the thousands of communities that would fit in that 30%, that would have been profitable or wouldn't have been profitable or had a business case for the private sector to deploy, 
that now is uh, profitable or there is a business case now to deploy because we've cut that 30% of the cost out. So that's one example of where through regulatory relief alone, we can flip the business case for communities and get more broadband out there. I'm going to actually ask a follow-up question, but first I want to say with respect to 5G, that's often used in a mobile context, but the fact is that 5G is both mobile and fixed. It can serve in either capacity. So presumably the small cell regulatory burden relief is going to help both fixed providers and mobile providers who are looking to deploy 5G technologies. But given that, there has been some criticism of 5G as being a municipal solution, a solution for cities that isn't really applicable in rural America. And what would you say to that? Yeah, there's been a bit of a, of a micro debate in DC about whether 5G and small cells is for big cities or is it for everywhere. Uh, I certainly come down on the it's for everywhere play, and there's a couple reasons for that. 5G, as you mentioned, is not only going to be these small cells, which have a relatively limited footprint. 5G is a technology that's going to be pushed down through all the spectrum bands, including the low 1 gigahertz, where we have much more uh, coverage. Uh, but also, as you point out, it's going to be used for fixed wireless, which is going to be an important play uh, in rural America. So for all these reasons, I think 5G is going to be everywhere. So at the end of the day, to me, that's going to be the measure of success. Places like New York, San Francisco, they're going to get 5G almost no matter what we do with the FCC from a regulatory perspective. Just the population density drives it. But we're focused on getting 5G everywhere, and that's why I think the regulatory relief is going to be a key part of that. So when we start looking at deploying 5G or anything else, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is money and money for deployment. And so I'm going to address my next question to Anne, which is the $600 million that has been appropriated. Can you give us some insight into what's happening with that? Sure. Well, I'm happy to touch a bit I'll, um, timeline as well as process, and I, I think I'll start with timeline because that's something that we get a lot of questions on. You know, I think the best way to describe our, our approach, our spirit with this, uh, with this important opportunity for rural America is that we are moving with, spe with speed but not haste. Uh, this is a brand new program, and we want to be good stewards of the taxpayer resources. Um, standing up a new program certainly requires a lot of careful planning uh, with the new requirements as well as all of the application systems that go into building a new program. Uh, we share a real sense of urgency in getting the program executed, but we want it to be sustainable. Uh, with respect to process, um, we have an entire team that is literally working each day on a number of critical steps uh, to build out this new program. Uh, first, there's a real uh, need for development of the IT, um, the online application system. We are looking to develop an IT system as part of this program that, of course, is modern, customer-friendly, and very importantly, secure. Uh, we will be building a, a more advanced platform than what we currently have for our loan applications, uh, really, that will enable us to include a module uh, for reviewing and underwriting these loans. In addition to the IT, I'll say a few words on, on the staffing that it takes to build something like this. Uh, this is a, a pilot, and so with that, uh, going through the contracting process, bringing on people that will be able to provide technical assistance and assist, really, with the program operations. Um, third, there's a number of policy options that need to be worked through in standing up a new program like this. Um, and we're really working through those carefully to make sure that USDA is making sound and, a sound and prudent investment with the resources allocated. For example, we have flexibility in the ability to do grants, loans, or a grant loan combo. So what is the right allocation of those options? And then lastly, we think that public input in this process is incredibly important in standing up a new program. We're setting up a web page that we will be using to receive public comments about the program, and this will also include a notice of inquiry that will be uh, published in the Federal Register. And I guess with that, I'll just close with simply saying that we have been locked in, if you will, um, for, for uh, several, uh, for some time for really doing things in the same old way. And this is a huge opportunity for us to look in innovating in the way we deploy this critical infrastructure, and we are maximizing that opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to switch subjects slightly and uh, direct this question to John. So the latest broadband progress reports, the 31% that we talked about earlier, and that doesn't even include the underserved people. So 
how do you see an increase in rural connectivity affecting ag industry? Do you think 5G is a part of that? I mean, how could you address that? A um, uh, couple thoughts. Um, uh, I think at this stage, much of the technology or the applications, if you will, that you saw and that are, are contemplated today are, are, uh, are 5G capabilities not necessary. Uh, we're, we're, we're designed for 3 to 4G. We're introducing that uh, increasingly. The, the issue really is more coverage than it is speed when it comes to agriculture today. Um, we're also technology neutral. I think I should stress that and appreciate also your point. Um, clearly, machines in the field need wireless. Uh, irrigation technology is probably dependent on wireless uh, features. But the producers who operate in those fields have needs back at the farmhouse and in the farm office, and they can clearly be addressed through fixed. Uh, so we're not in this to suggest what there's, there's one uh, technology that should be given preference to, but certainly we think that the needs of agriculture need to be factored in. Um, it's a long, we, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, the, the Precision Ag Bill that um, Senator Heitkamp mentioned um, and is included in both the House and Senate Farm Bills uh, has a goal of 95 percent of coverage of active croplands in the U.S. That's a very lofty goal. Um, I think the best way to get at that is to do it uh, in piecemeal fashion, small bites, figure out which states have the biggest gaps or which areas have the biggest gaps. And that comes back into the whole FCC mapping component, which I think uh, also uh, needs to be addressed. So there are a number of different ways to get out this. We just think agriculture needs to have a seat at the table. Yeah, first of all, I 100% agree, and I would like to just throw Arkansas as the 48th yeah. state. Like, yeah. just, right. you know. um, so related to that question, I believe, unless I am mistaken, that some of the equipment runs on sub-gigahertz spectrum, specifically 900 megahertz or unlicensed radio spectrum. Are you sent the equipment, and this is related to this technology question, what type of equipment are you considering in the field and what are you utilizing in the field and what technology advancements and can those run on some of these unlicensed spectrum that is available? Uh, the answer is yes and we've looked at that and, and it really, yeah, is this, yeah, I think it's on. Um, you know, the real, the, the issue really depends on the application at hand and what, what the, what the demand, the capacity demand is to be able to uh, deliver uh, whatever the value is, whether that's uh, a, a mapping uh, 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 capability or a, a, a shutoff capability or the like. So um, I, I, think, I think what you find in the field as a practical matter is a lot of different ways to work with what's available, and I think that would continue. Thank you. So with respect to the plan of technology, I'm going to turn back to you, Commissioner. You're talking about um, easing the regulatory burden and streamlining deployment, and I believe you mentioned the order in March, which relates to the deployment of small cells, I think, yes? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So would you, I know that you mentioned this briefly, but can you bring that home to how that order is going to directly benefit rural America? Sure. So right when we were um, in the middle of going to that decision, I went to my home state of Virginia to, uh, not far from here, obviously, the Shenandoah Valley. And I went to a small town called Woodstock. And the local provider there, Shentel, had just put up a new small cell outside of a high school. And it's one of these connected schools. Uh, talk to the kids a little bit. They are, they're brilliant. They've got very bright futures. They all get iPads, uh, and they do their curriculum online. And so there was a need for a small cell in that rural, very rural part of the country. And so that sort of proves this point that small cells isn't going to be purely an urban play. And what's the challenge there in Woodstock? Well, it's low population density and it's the cost. And so if you can reduce that cost of deploying a small cell there, you can pull 30% of the total cost out. That could be the difference between a provider going in with a small cell for those kids and a provider not. And so that's why regulatory reform is going to make a big difference, particularly outside of big cities, for getting uh, 5G, for getting small cells uh, to these communities. It's marvelous. I really hope that works because that's important. No, I mean, I'm serious. I, it, every, every little incremental reduction in cost of deploying rural America is going to yeah. help and move the ball forward. So I would like to follow up and ask you just sort of an open-ended question. What do you see next on the wireless infrastructure front? 
Well, one of the issues that we are working through right now as well is looking at state and local laws and how those can also help to promote deployments. And one of the things that we're looking at is if we have you know, outlier cities that have attachment or permitting fees that are, you know, let's say $30,000, that potentially is sucking up capital that otherwise could go to deploy to rural America. So we have a proceeding ongoing. Uh, we've been meeting with a lot of local officials. I've met with a lot of them on my trips to see where we can find the common ground that gets us to a point with the state and local reviews that nationally we're going to get 5G and 4G deployed to more communities. So that's what we're actively working on right now is with our state and local partners. It's what you all are working on in BDEC as well as looking at some of these same issues. Absolutely. So I'm going to turn to John and ask you about the Agricultural Broadband Coalition. You mentioned them. I know John Deere is a member. Do you want to talk about that and what you all do? And Sure. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's, a, it's an aggregation of equipment uh, providers, uh, producer groups, uh, retailers, um, uh, some from the uh, farm credit system. Um, and again, the focus is trying uh, really to bring some attention to, to, to the needs of agriculture uh, uh, as compared to the rest of, uh, if you will, the rural community. And I think maybe to point out that, you know, there's obviously uh, limited resources, and this isn't, we don't think should be a competition for resources. It's simply to be able to demonstrate where the needs are and where the value can be generated. But uh, our focus this past year has been in supporting uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Wicker in their Precision Ag Connectivity uh, Bill, which is simply uh, a piece of legislation to create uh, a task force that the FCC working with the USDA would um, would really try to drill down on where the gaps are for agriculture producers and ways to fill them. And I should just note that uh, provision is both in the Senate Ag Committee Farm Bill and in the, uh, the House uh, Ag uh, Bill HR2 that was uh, voted once and hopefully will be voted again. So uh, that's very close to coming to fruition, which, and I think many people in this room would probably uh, have a role in, in, in that work going forward, so. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna switch subjects slightly off of broadband for this last question and then we'll come back and we think we'll have enough time to open it up for a little bit of questions from others. This has to do with the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And obviously that affects everyone. That's not just an urban issue, it's a rural issue as well. So how is your agency addressing this issue? Well, I think we can take an issue like the opioid crisis that Senator Capito mentioned and really broaden this out uh, a little further with respect to uh, the stress that exists in many farm communities right now. As you, we've heard some discussion, the economy is, is very challenging for many farmers depending on what sector of the industry that you're in and with that stress becomes um, some real challenges with uh, respect to uh, suicide, uh, higher suicide rates and um, the opioid issue is certainly interrelated to all of that. I think this issue is a great example of the importance of broadband connectivity um, being a solution to many of the challenges that we see in rural America as well as the opportunities that we've heard about today. And when we look, about, look at this issue and the connection uh, between connectivity and uh, well-being with rural people, I think we see really two different pieces. We see that immediate response uh, if there are mental health challenges in a community or struggles with addiction, uh, connection is certainly a huge part of that solution with respect to delivering uh, treatment needs as well as mental health services. Um, it can be uh, telemedicine, distance learning that's possible through that e-connectivity can be used to provide training to a local workforce that can be helping the people that are living and working in rural America, or it can provide that remote access to specialized medical care that might be in a big city. And then as we think beyond what the needs are for that community, that immediate response, we can think about the conditions that are often present in many communities where mental health is a challenge. Um, oftentimes the solution for these issues in these places is greater prosperity. And I think from the discussion that we've heard today, it's clear that broadband connection is a huge part of continued prosperity in rural America. Yeah, 100%. Uh, telemedicine is so critical for that and other needs, and oftentimes the mental health needs are overlooked, how important it is to be able to get those types of services and broadband delivering that. So thank you, that's very useful, helpful point. Um, okay, so 
unless somebody on the staff tells me otherwise, we started 10 minutes late, so I'm gonna open the floor for questions. And that includes questions for the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee, which I'm happy to answer. Hmm. I think there was one in the back, yes ma'am. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question really quick. I believe the question was, could you please address what farms can and cannot access precision agriculture? What are the barriers with respect to cost for some farms achieving that? Yeah, you, uh, USDA did a study, um, Economic Research Service, uh, that came out last year, I think, but it was focused on 2013 data. And um, clearly the, the take rate, if you will, for technology is, is much higher with larger operations who have the capital in which to invest. I think you saw the producer in the video make the point that if it's not uh, uh, if it's not paying for itself, we're not gonna you know we're not gonna do it. And particularly these days, these years, uh, the farm economy, what it is, has been a challenge. Um, um, but uh, th there are, there are different applications that that work for different size operations and different kinds of operations. And so it's really going to depend on on what the producer wants to achieve and how quickly he can get a return on that investment uh, as to which way he goes. But we, we do see a bigger step forward with larger uh, operations today than we do the smaller ones. Thank you. Maybe there was a question in the back, or was that something? Did someone have a question back there? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, so we mentioned a couple times in the discussion about the, uh, the map, the broadband mapping problem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Director Carr, is there a chance if you can elaborate on what you see that problem to be? and what the FCC is doing to uh, sort of overcome the problem. Thanks, hey, it's, it's a challenge when you, you know, sit in D.C. and we try to figure out very precisely where there is 4G service and where there's not. And right now, we're going through a challenge process to try to help identify that. And what I've heard from a lot of people is that their own personal experience hasn't been reflected in the maps and the data that the FCC has put out preliminarily. And I get that. And part of the reason why is this concept of overbuilding. So you could have a cell phone with a provider X, and it could be cell phone model Y, and you're showing zero bars. And you could look at the FCC's map, and it could say you have LTE in this area. And to you, that doesn't make any sense. But it could be that with that same provider or a different model phone, you would have service, or it could be a different provider, same phone, you would have service. So I understand that there's been some frustration, and we've heard it loud and clear at the commission, uh, with our map, in our sort of challenge process as an initial matter, not reflecting every single consumer's experience. We've taken some steps to try to expand that challenge process and give more time for it so we can try to drive to even more accurate results. Okay. I believe the senator is here for closing remarks. Is there less call? Are you okay? All right, Senator King. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you there are lots of places that look good on your map and don't look good on mine. I, uh, I, I apologize for, for being late. I have a, an intelli have, uh, every Tuesday afternoon have an intelligence committee meeting and I'll, I'll share with you what we, no, I guess I won't. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I also will say uh, senators are quite often, in fact, very frequently called upon, and this is one of those times, to speak to a group of people where every single person in the audience knows more about the subject than you do. <laughs> but it won't hold me back. Um, no, I think this is a really important meeting. And great to see you again. I understand you're going to Maine. I am. That's yeah. wonderful. You're, you picked the right time of year. I think I did. Um, well, I, I, I don't want to reiterate everything that you've heard this afternoon except to say how important this topic is. Uh, I visited a, a dairy farm in Maine last summer and it was like Silicon Valley with fur. I mean, it was amazingly high tech. The application of fertilizer, the uh, irrigation, uh, the cows were milked on a, on a carousel. Imagine a merry-go-round with about 100 cows on it. And the cows come in one, one side, and the thing moves around very slowly, and they're milked. And by the time it gets to the other end, the milking is all done, and off they go. Each cow has a tag on its ear, 
which uh, tells the computer exactly how much milk they gave, what their feed situation is. I mean, it's a very, very uh, technologically uh, uh, heavy uh, kind of business, and broadband is a key part of it. Uh, being able to access databases and, and share information uh, is absolutely crucial. So that's why I think this is such an important uh, subject. And uh, Commissioner, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, and uh, I just want you to know that we're uh, all in. We've got there's some uh, language, there are two provisions in the in the farm bill, which I'm sure have been discussed, uh, that we hope will be uh, helpful in this process. The loan program is is one, and and we will uh, continue to work on this. And what I want to say to you, who I presume are all people that have knowledge of this subject, if there are things we're missing or other ways that we can be helpful, let us know. Uh, the most valuable commodity in my business are ideas. And if there are ideas that uh, we're not, don't, aren't in the Farm Bill and may be in next year or might be an amendment, uh, then we want to know what they are. We want, and, and, and this is so important for rural America. I mean, I, again, I'm sure everyone has said this, but uh, in Maine, uh, we have uh, communities uh, where there's no broadband uh, or very limited, and they have limited prospects. Uh, they're not going to be able to develop their economies, and they're not even going to be able to keep people living there. I mean, imagine going to look at a house with a realtor, and the realtor says, well, this is a really nice house, there's a nice view, you've got a front yard, two-car garage, but by the way, you can never have broadband. Chances are you wouldn't buy the house. And uh, so it's, it's, it's crucial to rural America to have this connectivity, and if we have it, then we can turn the tables on the urban areas because you'll have all the lifestyle advantages without the disadvantages. Uh, and we have lots of people now in the smaller communities in Maine that do have uh, good service, and that's making all the difference. I was in a town called Damrascata, which is uh, uh, in, in, on the coast of Maine. Walked into a storefront, and it was a, uh, it was a co-working space with broadband. And in that storefront, just the morning I happened to walk in, there was a guy doing coding for Cisco in, uh, in Boise, another guy who was doing database work for Oracle, uh, a woman who was the president of a virtual nonprofit to keep plastics out of the ocean, a freelance writer, um, a woman who was the marketing manager for a company in Illinois, and a woman who was doing design work for MIT in a little space about the size of the front of this room, but it was all because of the broadband. And this is an enormous opportunity for rural America, so I really appreciate all that you're doing, and I'm serious if there are um, ideas and ways that we can be more helpful. By the way, you should know, uh, because of all the news about how this place doesn't work and how messed up everything is, uh, the fact that we have a farm bill coming out in the next couple of days, uh, or it's already out, I guess, uh, of 20 to 1, a bipartisan bill uh, out of the Agriculture Committee, uh, is nothing short of miraculous. And it, it, it really is a testament to the members of that committee that they were willing to apply what I call the 80-20 rule. And one of my version of the 80-20 rule is you work on the 80% you agree on and put the 20% you don't agree on off to one side. And that's what they were able to do and come up with a, I think, a very strong bill uh, that'll probably be on the floor in the next, I don't know, what are you hearing, man? Next couple of weeks? Yeah, next week. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Uh, and it is a good bill. So uh, thank you all for your help on that. And thanks for, uh, for joining us today. I'm uh, delighted to be here. By the way, I should have said, my name is Angus King. I'm a U.S. Senator from Maine. <laughs> if you didn't know that, you can see the lobsters on the tide. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, and thank you to the panel for all that you've done. Great to be with you. I'm, I guess I'm adjourning us then. <laughs> we are adjourned. <laughs>